Keep your eyes closed and stand up if you think that you're smart. Okay, those eyes are still closed. You're not going to look around. You're not going to judge. Okay. All right. Sit back down. That was very interesting. We have a group of people with, um, I think, pretty decent self-esteem. I've never actually done this before. Well, I had this moment where I questioned, am I smart, when it was 9.01 p.m. at night and I was looking at a photo. It's a photo of a bunch of smiling teenagers, and they are exuberant, they're standing close together, they're very proud. They are my high school's National Merit Scholars, and they're preparing to receive a district commendation. This group of students will get the very best that life can hand them. They are going to Ivy League colleges, they are going to prestigious summer science research programs, they are winning tens of thousands of dollars in scholarships. They stand on the precipice of taking control of their lives, and they are owning it. Let's backtrack a little. How did they get here? When they were six years old, they nervously went to school and they took a test that placed them in the top percentile of their class and put them in my school district's exalted gifted program, where they took classes that were much harder than their gen ed counterparts. And so when they got to high school, they slid into honors and AP classes like they were the worth for them. They made straight A's all four years through our high school, and on a day in October, they took a test called the PSAT and they did well. Their story is the story of a privileged class of teenagers around the nation who knew what hoops they had to jump through and jumped. With the choreography so beautiful, it would make Olympic gymnasts, gymnastics Olympians proud. I used to believe that they earned those high scores and good grades and joyful smiles because they were the hardest working. That merit meant merit. But today, I wonder, even as much as I love these people, as some of the people in that, those photos were my closest friends, I wonder if we overestimate what testing can tell us about any given person's qualifications for the best schools, the best jobs, the best lives. I wonder if we have fallen too deeply in love with the idea that we can quantify merit. Most importantly, my hope is that you will walk away today with the idea that merit needs to be expanded beyond mere smartness into the many areas of excellence that represent the diversity of given population and the diversity of needs within a given economy. I ask this because ours is an age of relentless testing. Testing culture has made a shift focus from that which can be learned to that which can be trotted out and performed on a test. There is a difference. Think about the most important lessons you've learned in life and who taught them to you. Maybe they didn't all happen in the classroom, and certainly most of them can't be tested with an A through E multiple choice question. Unfortunately, this means that students have come to rely on that test tomorrow as our motivation for learning something, because intrinsic motivation and natural desire to learn have been so eroded. Contrary to popular belief, though, events with high stakes, things like those big tests that we prepare for months for, are not the best ways to motivate people at all. The famous business writer Daniel Pink speaks about this a lot. He's pointed out that people do better work when they're driving with their own passion. People at companies like Google and FedEx who are given company allotted free time or 20% time or whatever else it was, came up with products more innovative and creative within that free time than they did otherwise. Passion, not fear of loss or desire for reward, can lead to creative productivity. And at some point, these tests become dehumanizing. I say this because they strip away that most basic of human characteristics, the ones that make babies chew everything in sight and little kids ask why about everything. Curiosity. When it comes to curiosity, I hit rock bottom in mid-October. It was the night before a 100-point AP bio test, and as I glowered tearfully at a page filled with facts and figures about photosynthesis, which I curse to this day, despite the fact that it gives me all the food I eat, my dad said genially, do you know about the isotopes involved? And that was when I snapped. If it's not on the test, I don't care, I snarled. Now, to understand the gravity of this moment in my life, you have to understand a little bit about who I am. I was never the girl who raised her hand and said, um, is this on the test tomorrow? I was never that person who stayed up until 4 a.m. and had dates on Friday nights with my sexy pile of flashcards. But one test had me completely unwound. 
And my parents weren't even those tiger parents we hear so much about, the types who pressure you to achieve all A's on everything. Sometimes, I wish they had. When I was applying to college, every fiber of me wished that for four years I had had my very own rent-a-tiger parent. Parents who had shuttled me to SAT prep classes instead of just handing me the five bucks I needed to buy a used book from a friend. Parents who had told me you need to do math classes over the summer because it's not acceptable that you're taking algebra too while most of your friends are taking AP Cal. Yes, that is a big story. Parents who had said no more absences from school instead of letting me speak at conferences like this one and jet around the world to 15 countries and or to 15 uh, countries and 35 states. Speaking at conferences where I learned more in some weeks than I ever had in school. Or wait, did I really want those alternate universe parents? I'm glad, ultimately, that I had the parents I had. That I had parents who were brave enough to reject, or perhaps clueless enough not to know, what it takes in these days of high stakes testing and cutthroat competition to get into the most prestigious colleges. Well, my parents were brave or clueless, but I'm not. And some school days provide me with very good duels between my innate desire to learn, out of curiosity to read all the dozens of books I've checked out from the library on one spree, versus my desire to learn for someone else's ranking to get that A on the test. That tunnel vision takes focus and time away from independent learning. Independent learning is what we need more of. I see it as a solution. At Monument Mountain High School in Massachusetts, there is a handful of teenagers in a room conducting something that is changing education. It's called the Independent Project. It's a school within a school program that a kid started a couple of years ago, built around the idea that students can be independent learners within a collaborative group. Instead of spoon-feeding them curriculum, Every student's day is divided in half, one half for an independent endeavor, like learning the piano or writing your first novel, and the other half for inquiry-based learning from the natural and social sciences. In this program, they ask questions like how do mice react to aromatherapy, and is there science behind old wives' tales? They read more books in eight weeks than their AP Lang class read in a school year, but most importantly, they loved it. Students from across the academic spectrum, from straight-A students to special ed, all piled in a spare room and transformed it into a home base for learning. The power of the independent project is best summarized by the Antoine saint three quote at the beginning of the documentary about the project. If you want to build a ship, don't drum up the men to gather wood, divide the work, and give orders. Instead, teach them to yearn for the vast and endless sea. I want this to be what education does. I want this to be what education is. Not the four years that prepare me for taking tests, but the four years that make me fall in love with learning. Or, more accurately, never make me fall out of love with it in the first place. And yet, nationally, we're moving towards more testing that benefits a large and powerful industry in the wake of No Child Left Behind. PBS did this story on Frontline where they pointed out the growth of the educational industrial complex. It said, testing is a burgeoning industry. Test sales in 1955, adjusted to 1998 dollars, were $7 million. That figure was $263 million in 1997, an increase of more than 3,000%. Today, those numbers are even higher. As the former Deputy Secretary of Education, Diane Ravitch, has said, this corporatizing endangers the principles of equity and inclusion that public schools at their best embody. After all, the free market naturally generates inequalities, and so its involvement in education reform have distracted from the problems of poverty and segregation by race and class. Our current interpretation of what merit is, of what smartness is, often leads us to accidentally perpetuate long-held inequalities along socioeconomic, geographic, and racial lines. Consider Hunter College High School in New York City. It's an elite public secondary school, and it uses a test every year to select its entering class. They have to make up a very narrow top percentile of test takers. Some years back, they chose a student named Hudson who was headed to Columbia to give the valedictorian address. And in his speech, he said, more than happiness, relief, fear, or sadness, I feel guilty. I feel guilty because I don't deserve any of this, and neither do any of you. We received an outstanding education at no charge based solely on our performance on a test we took when we were 11-year-olds or 4-year-olds. 
We receive superior teachers and additional resources based on our status as gifted, while kids who naturally needed those resources much more than us wallowed in the mire of a broken system. And now we stand on the precipice of our lives in control of our lives based purely and simply on luck and circumstance. We are talking about 11 year olds. We are deciding children's fates before they even had a chance. We are playing God and we are losing. Kids are losing the opportunity to go to college or obtain a career because no one taught them long division or colors. Hunter is perpetuating a system in which children who contain unbridled and untapped intellect and creativity are discarded like refuse. And we have the audacity to say they deserved it because we're smarter than them. We have the audacity to say we're smarter than them. The word meritocracy first entered the popular lexicon because a British member of parliament named Michael Young wrote a book in the 1950s called The Rise of the Meritocracy. And in that book, he described a new British social system called the meritocracy. It would create a new elite by testing all children and then segregating them, putting the best in the best schools with the best resources. It sounds familiar for a reason. We do it. In reading about Michael Young's vision, I was reminded of the Quest program, my home district's gifted program. It's a very insular community, and once you become a Questie, you stay a Questie, even after you go to high school. These friend groups are solidified by having spent eight years in the same classes with the same people, and it creates an unfortunate dichotomy that I've heard again and again and again from my friends who are Questies, where the Questies are smart and the Gen Head kids are stupid. The experience of middle and high schoolers who went through that program, their whole educational experience is defined by conformity and linearity. Everybody takes AP Lincoln 12th grade, everyone takes AP Calc BC. But we don't need more students who absolutely hate derivatives and never want to go into hard science taking Calc, or students who would rather write grant proposals than analyses of Jane Eyre taking Lit. What we need instead is variety. Variety to combat the segregation caused by providing strict tracks that divide kids into stupid and smart. At Bard College Early High School in New York, instead of worrying about choosing between AP classes, students have options like equality and novels of Fyodor Dostoevsky. Variety doesn't just mean more academic courses. It must mean a broader range of career-focused courses as well. A cover story of time described at high school gave students a tech-focused education that enabled them to take guaranteed jobs at IBM, the major sponsor of the school, after they graduated. And the students said they were motivated by their connection to industry and the real-world context of their learning. However, one thing you notice very quickly flipping through that story in Time Magazine is that students were almost universally African-American and from low-income brackets. And there should be nothing stigmatizing or segregating about an education that focuses on real-world components as much as it does on academics. To put it more bluntly, there is no reason why I, as a half-Asian, half-white girl from the high-performing suburbs of Seattle, should be directed away from career-focused education any more than an African-American boy in a disadvantaged neighborhood should be directed toward it. Variety is useless unless every student has a true choice and not one chosen because of their zip code, income, or the color of their skin. To go back to Michael Young's book, The Rise of the Meritocracy, here's the kicker. Michael Young's vision wasn't supposed to be an ideal. His book was a dystopia. A dystopia. In 2001, he said publicly that the book was a satire meant to be a warning. This, the book that gave us meritocracy in our popular lexicon. Clearly, we didn't get that memo. Our society runs on the hubris of believing that we know the ins and outs of quantifying merit. If someone does well in the PSAT, they can become a national merit scholar. That is a misnomer because multiple choice tests are desperately imperfect ways to determine merit. You win if you're wealthy. SAT scores are directly correlated to income. You win if you're an educator with no scruples, as in the case in Georgia, where teachers huddle on mass in rooms to change students' answers on tests. And before the story leaked, the superintendent there was lauded for improving urban schools, an illusion created by cheating. The true scandal to me, though, is less that so many educators cheated, and more that those tests were our sole measure of whether those schools were doing well. Because you can produce the most shiny and gleaming of A's and B's and still have a school that is rotten at its core, with stressed out students who feel like they only have to regurgitate what they've learned on a test, Teachers and staff so stressed by the drive to produce high scores that they focus narrowly on that goal only, and the lack of a cohesive community that celebrates the kinds of merit that don't get tested. My sister's ability on the piano, 
or somebody's ability in, with the test tube in the science lab, or entrepreneurship. So what does this all mean for our society? To emphasize the pervasive falsehood that we know what it means to be meritorious because of how someone does on a test, is to drive a destructive attitude into our universities and our lives that, to quote author Christopher Hayes, makes intelligence its highest virtue. It isn't just a celebration of smartness that characterizes the culture of meritocracy, he says. It's something more pernicious. A conviction that smartness is rankable and that the hierarchy of intelligence, like the hierarchy of wealth, never plateaus. While smartness is important, it's far from sufficient. Wisdom, judgment, empathy, and ethical rigor are all as important, even if those traits are far less valued. Indeed, extreme intelligence without those qualities is destructive. But empathy does not impress the same way smartness does, because smartness dazzles and mesmerizes." End quote. Many people will say that school is supposed to be preparation for society, and society hands working adults the business equivalents of scantrons and SATs. Competitions and ranking systems like the brutal one at J.P. Morgan that just fires you through at the bottom 10 percent, no questions asked. Life, many say, is a rat race. Personally, I think that we build what we want our societies to be in our schools. And I want a school that doesn't hand me a rat race because I want a society that values me as more than a class rank, a score, a percentile. We value the people in our lives, I hope, not because of how they do on some objective scale or some questionnaire, but because of who they are. People who eat and dance and love and cry and whose brief moment in the sun makes ours a little brighter. And I dare you to show me a test that can measure that. I've talked about school-based solutions, but there's something we can all do, regardless of how long we've been in or out of school. We can prioritize those things that are just as important as smartness. We can prioritize ethics and empathy. A few months ago, I was at this event called We Day in Seattle, started by the Kielberger Brothers, who founded a nonprofit called Free the Children. And We Day is a little bit mega churchy in its vibe. But it's basically packing thousands of kids in a stadium and celebrating doing good. There's no way to buy your ticket in the day. You have to do a year of community service. And the fact that there's this element of celebration, the kind of celebration and enthusiasm you usually see for singers or sports stars all around volunteerism, that really inspired me. This is an example of how we can celebrate. If you look up hashtag Jessica's Tufts on Twitter, you'll see that students at Sacred Heart Cathedral Prep in San Francisco are protesting a decision their school made to eliminate one girl's photo from the yearbook simply because she was wearing a tux instead of a dress. And they said, we're not going to stand for that. I have a friend there, and I know that their school has great academics, has great sports. It could be celebrated for any number of things, but they are being celebrated now because of how their students are doing the right thing. And that is the kind of thing we need to see more. The solutions I discussed may not seem like direct challenges to high stakes tests. What is all this about independence and variety and ethics? Well, you see, they're not supposed to be. I lied. This talk was never about testing. It was about challenging something far deeper. The underlying ideal that merit is a singular score. Independence, variety, and our prioritization of ethics help to promote the idea that the strength of a society comes from the diversity of ways we find merit and reward it. So next time, before you say, you're so pretty, or you're so smart, try to expand your range of compliments and think about complimenting someone for how kind they are, how good they are, how empathetic, and all the other things that we need to value just as much. No economy of diverse individuals can flourish if we do not find merit in wider expressions of excellence beyond smartness in academics. As we learn to recognize and reward the value of a broader spectrum of human talents and skills, we in turn expand, advance, and diversify our financial systems, the richness of our shared way of life, and the quality of our existence. It begins with us in this room right now, and I believe we can do it. Thank you.